was round. Growing up in Africa, the son of English settlers, I often accompanied my mother, a doctor, on her rounds. We went in her car, which was like a mobile clinic. It was fitted with a medical chest with a wonderful array of equipment, glinting stubbles, cotton swabs, dozens of pill bottles and tubes of ointment. We covered hundreds of kilometers around Melseta village in the rural eastern highlands of what was then southern Rhodesia. All of life was there and sometimes dead. My mother's single biggest lifesaver was a vaccination program, which was close to her heart. Grand tours to inoculate people against smallpox, diphtheria, tuberculosis and polio became part of our dry season routine. Our journey took us high up towards the guttering granite Jemani Mani Mountains. These bordered the most remote, unexplored part of Mozambique, where a guerrilla war against the colonial Portuguese was underway. We have We had sent word ahead and when we arrived, thousands of the local Nadal people had gathered most of them from across the border. We weren't supposed to vaccinate Mozambicans, but my mother felt it made sense because the Nado crossed the border so freely. I helped with the polio vaccine for the children. I held a tray of sugar lumps and would give one to each person. Behind me came a health assistant with a bottle of vaccine. He would squeeze a drop of bright pink solution into each lump. Then I'd call for towels out and march down the line checking that the children had all swallowed. My biggest problem was to prevent them from coming round again to get a second sugar lump. Those were the days of relative peace. But as I came into manhood in the 1970s, the war for black majority rule escalated in Rhodesia. Our district, with its long border with Mozambique, was devastated. Nearly every farm was attacked. For almost 10 years, humans never ventured into the vast minefield near the mountains at all. I left for England. I tried to forget Africa, to dismiss my homeland, now renamed Zimbabwe, as a place with too many brutal violent memories, a place of death. I took up journalism and began working for the London Sunday Times. In 1986, the paper assigned me to South Africa, where the black townships were in flames on a daily basis. It was on my base in Johannesburg that I ventured back to Mozambique for the first time since my childhood. By then, Mozambique had been battered by decades of war and famine. It was said to be the poorest country in the world. The Marxist government was itself struggling against a new generation of rebels. It was widely reported that the Mozambique rebels had bases in neighboring Malawi, though no one had any proof. Malawi normally banned foreign journalists, but taking advantage of a tour by Prince Charles, I slipped in as part of the official press on Torridge. I soon split off from the group and headed south. For a day and a half, I drove along the Mozambique border, speaking to locals and missionaries. Finally, in the middle of the second day, I stopped at a trading store. The interior was almost black. After the bright sun outside, I asked the storekeeper if he ever saw rebels on this side of the border. My eyes got used to the darkness, just in time to see his white smile disappear. From the furthest corner, I heard metallic chinking. Who wants to know? asked a deep voice. In the corner were six men swathed in bandoliers of ammunition with dull brown grenades dangling from their webbing. Russian Kalashnikov rifles were propped against the wall. A rocket launcher was laid across a concrete table as the men drank soda. You coming with us, said one of the men. Back to our base. And with that, they all got up to leave, their ironmongering clanking. We trudged south through scrub. The patrol's English seeker veered off and I was left with five heavily armed gorillas and no way to communicate. They were led by a thuggish sergeant who, despite the intense heat, wore a fleece-lined Russian aviator's hat with furry earlaps that dangled to his shoulders like spaniel ears. At every rebel encampment to be passed, I sensed the story of my capture being embellished. I had been armed. I had resisted. I was a spy. Sometimes the story was accompanied by cuffs and kicks. I started to worry that the red-eyed sergeant might shoot me to impress his comrades. On the second day, we finally reached their base. I was
was presented to the camp commander, a small man in olive petites. As he listened to the long report of my capture, his dinner arrived. I was ordered to wait. Until now, I had not understood the languages they were speaking. A mixture of northern Mozambican and Malawian dialects interspersed with praises of Portuguese. But now I distinctly heard the commander give orders to his servant in Chinadao, a dialect used by the Nadao people. I listened a little longer to be sure and then tentatively greeted the commander in what I could remember of Chinadao. He was amazed. Where did you learn this language? he asked. I told him I had lived in Chimani Mani Mountains on the Rhodesian side as a boy. What is your family name? he asked. Godwin. Godwin, he said hopefully, turning over the name. Was your mother the doctor on that side? Yes, I said. She was the government medical officer for the Melsetter district. He smiled and shook his head and put out his hand for an African handshake. She was the one who vaccinated me when I was a child. Pulling up his sleeve, he showed me a small vaccination scar on his shoulder. Did you ever go with your mother to help her? He asked. I nodded. Yes, he said. You gave me the sugar medicine. I remember now. We put out our tongues and you came down the road with a tray of lumps and put one on each tongue. Look now, he said. I grew up strong. In a few minutes, I had been elevated from hostage to an honored guest. I was ushered to a seat at the commander's right hand. My capturing sergeant had melted away. The following day, I was escorted to Malawi. At the border, my escort handed back the items they had confiscated. Before they left, they insisted on a formal group photograph for Rebels and me. The sergeant still wearing his furry flying hat, his arms resting on my shoulder in an act of possessive camaraderie. I have the photo still, a testament to the permanence of good deeds.